Hi, everyone. Um, thank you to the uh, now 34 attendees who are here with us uh, uh, today for uh, this uh, special uh, uh, policy session. So uh, my name is Elena Verdolini, and I think uh, uh, I'll be the chair. Um, and I think uh, uh, at this point, uh, it's, it's a good time to start. So um, without further ado, let me uh, share my screen and uh, introduce you to, uh, to the policy session. That should be it. Okay, um, so as I was mentioning, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I have to say um, I'm not particularly excited to be doing this remotely. I would have very much preferred to be there in Berlin and to be face to face with people. Unfortunately, this was not possible, uh, but at the same time, I think it's a great opportunity to keep this conference going, uh, notwithstanding everything. So I think it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, even if remotely. The policy session, as uh, you all should know, um, is uh, uh, called uh, the uh, RFF. Uh, um, it's a, a, policies, a special policy session on policies to support workers and communities in the transition to clean energy economies in the US and in the EU. As I was mentioning, my name is Elena Verdolini. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Brescia. I'm also a senior scientist at the RFF CMCC European Institute on Economics and the Environment, and I'm also lead author in the uh, sixth assessment cycle of the IPCC Working Group 3, uh, Chapter 16. So before we dive into the content of this presentation, let me uh, just give you a background on uh, uh, the title, on the initial part of the title of this session, which is the RFF CMCC EDF uh, policy session. And the way in which I'm going to do that, I'm going to introduce our institution, I will start from RFF, uh, RFF and CMCC. Uh, I think you all uh, probably know them. Uh, in any case, uh, these are two leading international research institutes uh, that focus on economics, climate, and uh, environment. This institute joined forces a few years back in a transatlantic partnership, and uh, the RFF CMCC EIEE, European Institute on Economics and the Environment, was basically the product uh, of this uh, um, uh, partnership. The institute itself is located in Milan and uh, um, its uh, mission is to improve environmental, energy and natural resource decisions through impartial economic research and policy engagement. The third institution that contributed to putting together this policy session is uh, the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, which is a non-governmental non uh, organization that leverages on science, economics, law and policy in order to tackle urgent environmental challenges. As you probably also all know, EDF is headquartered in the United States, but it has offices and staff uh, um, all around the world. So uh, these three institutions decided to come together in these policy sessions on policies uh, to support the energy transition. And just to give you a, a preview of where we're going, let me tell you what's going to happen in the next um, perhaps hour and 45 minutes. Um, I will be giving you an introduction uh, uh, at the beginning of the section. Then I will leave the floor to Felipe Meilleur. Uh, he is, uh, um, uh, Felipe is an advisor on climate, energy and industrial policies at uh, ETUC, which stands for European Trade uh, Union Confederation. And uh, prior to joining the ETUC, uh, he worked as an energy uh, policy specialist for an EU trade association. And Felix holds a master uh, degree in political science from UCL, uh, Belgium. After that, Anna, uh, uh, Felix is going to focus on uh, providing us with a trade union perspective, which I think is a crucial part uh, in this conversation. Uh, following that, Anna is going to uh, give us, uh, uh, provide some insights on the specific case of Germany. Anna is a research associate and doctoral student uh, at the Technical University of Berlin, um, which is our very own host in this conference. <laughs> and she's part of the junior research, um, and she's part of the junior research group called Exit. She's also a guest researcher at the German Institute for Economic Research in Berlin. Uh, and she's actually an industrial engineer with a focus on energy and resource management. Um, uh, and for these very specific reasons, the research is centered around coal and gas markets as well as energy transformation. Then uh, Hannah will leave the floor to Marion Dumas uh, from uh, 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 the Grantham Research Institute at LSE where she is uh, an assistant professor um, 
uh, the current research, fo research focus of uh, Marion is actually around green innovation and industrial reform for ecological transition. She holds a, um, a Bachelor of Science in Earth and Atmospheric Science from MIT, a Master of Science in Environmental Science from ETH Zurich, and a PhD from Columbia in Sustainable Development. Um, after uh, Marion, uh, Jan will take the floor and he will, uh, Marion will provide us with insights on the United Kingdom situation and, and, uh, and transition research. After this, Jan Vitajewski uh, will uh, um, focus on another very important and crucial country in Europe, which is Poland. Uh, Jan is actually a director of the Warsaw, Warsaw Ecological Economic Center at the University of Warsaw. Is an assistant professor at the Faculty of Economic Sciences uh, at the University of Warsaw and a senior researcher at the Center for Climate and Energy Analysis. Uh, Jan is also a um, lead author of the uh, Assessment Report 6 of the IPCC. Uh, finally, we will move on from the European perspective onto uh, the US perspective, and we're going to have both uh, Jake, uh, the uh, picture on the top, and uh, Wes coming in with two presentations. Jake is going to provide us um, uh, some insights on the US policy context, whereas Wes, uh, Wesley Locke is going to focus on transition policy research. Um, Jake is a senior analyst uh, in US climate policy division of EDF. He has previously worked as a data analyst and as a policy assistant at the White House Office of Energy and Climate Change. Uh, Wes, Wesley Locke is a senior research associate at RFF. He previously served as an advisor on energy and environment to the U.S. Senate Finance Committee and ranking member Senator, uh, Senator Whedon. Um, uh, Wes has advised uh, Senator Whedon on a range, uh, on a range of uh, clean energy and climate policies, including the Senator's uh, energy policy portfolio on the Senate Energy Committee. So this will be the first part of this policy session where each of these presenters is going to give you a brief uh, insight on, on their work on the field of uh, policies to support the workers uh, and the communities in the clean energy transition. And then the second part of the policy session is actually structured as a roundtable discussion when uh, we will uh, uh, ask uh, the speakers and challenge them with a few questions related to this important uh, uh, topic. So without any further ado, let me go into my piece, which is an introduction. You could also name this uh, a brief presentation on insights and questions that arise from a scoping of policies available in the EU to support workers and community in the transition to clean energy economies. Um, so um, I would like in this introduction to provide some framing for the discussion and to briefly put on the table a few of the key issues, questions, and perspectives that I myself am struggling with as I move on um, onto this research field. So um, I don't think I have to argue with any of you in this room, given your interest about the topic and the fact that you are here, that uh, reducing greenhouse gas emission is a necessary step to avoid the, the drastic impacts associated with climate change. And the transition towards clean energy poses actually a great number of technological uh, and scientific challenges. I think you're all familiar with the wedge that we see on the, on the right, where you see, um, where you can actually visualize the type of effort that will be needed over time in order to move from a, what is called either a business as usual or a current policy scenario, which is the eye line in the, the dark purple, onto uh, um, a more sustainable emission pathway, the two degree scenario, uh, which is the, red, uh, the pink one um, that uh, tilts toward the bottom. Now, the problem uh, with this, uh, uh, with reducing greenhouse gas emissions are not only technological and scientific, but they also, uh, um, uh, the fact that we're gonna need to put in place very ambitious climate policies will, will also result in unprecedented socioeconomic challenges. And this is due particularly to the fact that we will push for lower fossil fuel use. So we will try to reduce the demand for fossil fuel. And this will require to change the energy sector as well as all other sectors of the economy, including industry, agriculture, um, transportation, and buildings. And this will have serious employment and income impacts uh, in all countries uh, which will engage in this process, uh, raising at the same time also competitiveness concerns uh, and economic uh, uh, problems. Now, many of the regions and communities 
um, uh, in Europe are vulnerable to this potential negative effect. And the important thing to keep in mind is that a lot of these regions also have already experienced the consequences of this deindustrialization, economic dislocation, and slowdown in recent decades. And uh, I think we are all very aware of the fact that resistance by workers and communities is actually a major barrier to decarbonization. And if we just have to name one example of this, you can think of the Yellow Vests uh, protests. That were, um, that were generating all sorts of unrest uh, in France uh, and have been doing so for a, for a while. So the economic downturn, uh, which is linked with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, um, situation, it's actually uh, exacerbating this preoccupation and it's actually moving to de jeopardizing climate action in an even stronger fashion. So I think that the topic that we're going to be addressing here today is actually a very relevant topic. It was, it was so before COVID-19, and I think it's going to be even more so uh, now that we need to move out of this uh, uh, potential economic downturn. So in this context, uh, the topic, uh, the struggle, the promotion of a just transition is actually of paramount importance because we need to promote and design the energy transition in such a way that it takes into account the imperatives of uh, a just transition for the workforce and of the creation, the creation of a decent work and quality jobs in accordance with nationally defined development priorities. And let me just remind you that what I'm doing here is I'm simply citing the preamble of the Paris Agreement, which is, uh, uh, has been signed by basically the majority, I mean, almost all countries in the world. Now, this uh, brings us to a next question, which is, and I'm taking here a US focused perspective because of the nature of this conference, is uh, um, who is most at risk in the EU? Uh, in fact, the idea of promoting a just transition is actually hardly arguable. I would question uh, that anybody would raise their hands and say, no, I mean, we have to go for an unjust transition. It's so much better than a just transition. So the word just transition is actually something that can, that can be very well embraced and accepted by a number of uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, you know, people, politicians, policy makers, um, and, uh, and you name it. Now, when it comes to putting into place the just transition, justice is actually a very difficult concept uh, to frame, to decide, and, and to operationalize. Be and the reason for this is because what is just, uh, may be just to some people, may actually be very unjust to other people. And so um, one aspect that is, that is, I think, also undisputed in this debate is the fact that the costs of the transition, of the clean energy transition, should not fall overwhelmingly on the most disadvantaged people, workers and communities in the country which is embarking into such a transition. And this to me actually begs the question, how is it possible to identify the most vulnerable people, the most vulnerable workers? Which communities are most exposed to the risk? What, which regions should we worry more about and which countries? Now, um, in, in the, uh, looking at the European perspective, uh, vulnerability depends uh, on a lot, uh, on a series of factors. First and foremost is the presence or absence of, of carbon intensive sectors. And by carbon intensive sectors, I do not only mean fossil fuel extraction and processing, which is uh, what most of the research, actually the, the initial research was focusing on, but also uh, internal combustion engine and manufacture, um, manufacture of energy intensive goods and agriculture. Um, another factor which increases vulnerability is the share of employment in such sectors. How much weight does this, uh, do these sectors have in the um, economy of a given region or country? Uh, what we need to worry about is also the high and pre-existing rates of unemployment in the region. It's obviously easier to transition uh, to a different type of economic system if you have economic opportunities in other sectors. If such opportunities are not there, which is the case in many regions, for instance in Europe, then this becomes an even more tightening constraint. Low levels of education contribute to, making, to increasing vulnerability because people with low levels of education are hardly um, um, able to move to a different job, either upward or in a different sector. And the foreseen uh, decline, another important factor which we, uh, we need to keep into consideration is the, the foreseen decline in uh, that this region or community or sector or country would foresee a deep decarbonization scenario. 
What I'm trying to say with this last sentence, which I hope is clear, is that vulnerability is also a function of what is going to happen, not only of what is on the table right now. So for instance, let me give you an example. This is a map that has been built by colleagues within a project that we were working on, and it shows uh, uh, an index of vulnerability by European NATS2 regions, which has been computed uh, following an accounting procedure that takes into account all the things that I just mentioned here before. I'm using this map simply as an example of the fact that uh, um, to show that in fact Europe is very, very heterogeneous in terms of vulnerability when it comes to countries, but also within countries when it comes to different regions. And if you look, for instance, in my own country, Italy, you will see that we have regions that, um, that span the whole spectrum, basically, or a very uh, large uh, part of the spectrum of vulnerability. So um, moving on to the focus of our work, um, in this context, uh, what, uh, what us, the European Institute on Economics and the Environment did was to join forces with RFF and EDF in an effort to inform and support the implementation of policies which would uh, um, make it easier for workers and community in the clean energy transition uh, to accept uh, this, this transition and this change. What we are trying to do is we're trying to focus on understanding what policies, programs are available, were used in the past or can be used in the future in the context of a just transition at the European level and also in certain selecting countries. So um, you are going to hear more about this project in the last two presentations, uh, but what I want to put on the table here is just a few reflections uh, um, in the next couple of slides that come from uh, the initial part of this work that we've been doing. So what I told you is that we were trying to uh, identify policies, basically understand what kind of tools are available for policymakers to design and promote the just transition. And I think that the potential of our work is actually best illustrated if we look specifically at the EU Green Deal, which is probably the newest, uh, 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 which is definitely the newest proposal on the table and which uh, uh, many of us uh, um, uh, are familiar with. So the EU Green Deal is a strategy. I think it's important to recognize it as a strategy because what, it, what's, what a strategy means, it means that it is a, 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 it is a, a collection, the contemporaneous use of several programs, approaches, policy instruments. Uh, it's, it's a portfolio of, of, uh, of instruments that Europe is going to use to promote uh, um, uh, the move towards a sustainable economy that aims at making sure that no one is left behind. And if you look at the um, EU Green Deal, you will see that uh, in the depiction of the EU Green Deal, uh, uh, which has been circulated by, by the European, uh, by, by the van der Leyen Commission, actually there is a specific place, a specific placeholder for the just transition mechanism, which is what is highlighted in this slide. And um, what I think it's interesting about this picture and makes me think a lot is that this, uh, this square, this transparent square, it's actually positioned there and it, has, it, it is as, at the crossroad. It, it touches upon very many things. As you can see, this is not by, by chance or by mistake. So the just transition mechanism are funds that are going to be used to promote the, the just transition, which partly come from the EU budget, which are supposed to come from the EU, EU uh, to, uh, from the invest EU. Um, uh, financial pot and, and guarantee, and also from national co-financing structural funds. Okay, so um, why I think this is interesting and can help uh, highlight the importance of our work, because the EU Green Deal is actually uh, leveraging mostly on current funds. It has in fact uh, been described uh, in very many instances as the most significant attempt at restructuring the flow of EU funding and the aim of EU programs. So the Just Transition Fund is actually a component which will be financed through several channels and many of them are redirection of funds that are already actually on the table. So in this context, I think it is key to understand and to realize what instruments can be direct, redirected and how and what programs and policies are there and how can they be modified to support the Just Transition. And I think this is important for at least three reasons. The first, we need to ensure that all funds and programs are appropriately redirected. Second, we need to ensure that all funds and programs which are not, syner which are not synergic with the, the just transition are dropped, modified or restructured. This is a non-trivial thing to do if you think about, for instance, the topic of fossil fuel in the EU. 
And finally, we need to understand what other funds and programs are hurt by this redirection and this restructuring, because it's crucial to understand and to ensure that this is not a zero-sum game. Okay, the funds that were previously, for instance, devoted to regional governments are not simply taken away from them in one way and channeled to the just transition fund in another way, because this, I think, would be a very uh, big preoccupation and it would lead, uh, I mean, it, it would be necessary to understand that this is happening because the strategy to move forward then would be a different one. So let me just leave you with the four main issues that I think uh, would be a good topic uh, uh, to, to good food for thought uh, among the many questions that we can ask. Some of the issues we're currently exploring in this research are what is the correct approach to a just transition? What is the optimal balance of target policies? And by target policies, I mean policies that are focused on specific regions, communities, or stakeholder groups. Um, and of broader structural policies, policies that on the other hand aim at changing the full structure of our economic system and redirection of investment and funds. The second um, reflection that I think is an interesting one is how can we ensure that consideration for a just transition um, are embedded, is embedded in all programs and policies? Looking, starting from economic development, from employment programs, investment, education, health, infrastructure development, and so on and so forth. The third um, uh, question that we are trying to struggle with and that we are struggling with is the just transition is in fact generally discussed in the context of the clean energy transition. This is the way in which the just transition um, research uh, actually started to come about. But in fact, if you think about it, issues, uh, uh, similar issues to the one uh, considered in the just transition actually appear with respect to other, uh, several other macro trends. And let me just mention one, which to me is particularly important in this time of my life, which is the digitalization mega trend and the disruption that digitalization and automated work and artificial intelligence will potentially bring uh, uh, on, uh, on our economies and our society. And lastly, I wanted to um, uh, just uh, point out that the uh, International Labour Organization guidelines for a just transition actually highlight two functional components of just transition, right? The first one is the outcome or are the outcomes and the second one is the process. And I think this is an important question to ask because we need to ensure not only that we get to a just transition, but that we get there by bringing the relevant stakeholders on board. And to be honest, being a, an economist and a researcher, I think this is a very challenging thing to put into practice. So let me leave you at that. Uh, this was my introduction. What I tried to do here was to frame um, our uh, policy session and provide some initial food for thought. I will stop to share my screen and uh, I will uh, pass the floor to uh, Felix who is going to provide us with uh, um, a perspective on, uh, uh, from the trade union uh, and how they're dealing with this issue. So Felix, please, the floor is, the floor is yours. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Elena, for this presentation. I fully agree with, with all what you said, and it's, uh, it's, it's a very good introduction to the topic. Um, maybe before I start, uh, just a few words about the ETUC I, I represent here. The ETUC is the European Trade Union Confederation, and it was set up in, in 1973. And it's the organization that represents the workers uh, at the European level and that relay the workers' concerns and recommendations in the EU decision-making process. And in terms of members or affiliates, the ETUC has 90 uh, national trade unions. Uh, present in 38 different countries and we represent as well uh, 10 different sectoral uh, federations at the EU level. So this is just uh, to, to, to let you know more or less uh, who, who I represent. And um, I think you are totally right in your introduction in saying that the concept of just transition is quite hard to define actually. And I think it's interesting in that case to go back a little bit back in history and look at where this uh, just transition concept comes from. And actually, uh, the, the, the concept of just transition was first brought uh, by the trade union movement uh, in the US, actually. And it doesn't come uh, surprisingly in relation to climate initially, but rather in the, uh, from a trade unionist named uh, Tony Mazzocchi, and who was active in the atomic sector. And 
the concept, the concept of just transition emerged in the 1970s in the context of nuclear disarmament. And the idea of just transition at that time was to protect the workers from the nuclear sector while advocating at the same, at the same time for the phase out of nuclear weapons. And then in the 90s, the concept was revisited uh, with uh, more uh, environmental considerations. And the, this, the idea was the same, to protect workers that were working in the polluting industries, while at the same time being able to advocate for a phase out of these uh, industries with uh, high pollution. And then later on, uh, the concept, as you rightly point out, was adopted by uh, the International and Trade Union Organization, the ITUC and the ETUC. And then it was acted in the ILO guidelines that you quoted and that I recommend everybody to read because they are very uh, well done, I think, and in the Paris Agreement. So this is just a little bit to set a bit the framework of, of where this just transition uh, concept come from. Now, uh, to, to finish this first introduction, I will uh, tell you about what we as trade union mean by just transition. Uh, because especially at the EU level, the, since we talk about this Just Transition Fund, uh, many other stakeholders has, have taken it on board and everybody kind of puts something behind that concept, which is not always the, the same perspective. So for us, um, there are two words in Just Transition. Transition first. So for the trade union movement, it's clear that there are no jobs on a dead planet. And therefore, uh, we should uh, start moving towards uh, policies that are in line with the Paris Agreement. And the, the status quo is not a solution. So this is clear uh, for us. And then there is this concept of just. And as you say, for us, uh, the transition must be just in terms of output. So to reduce the inequalities and to make sure it leaves nobody uh, behind. And in terms of process, uh, so it must be inclusive and I will come back to that uh, later. And then the just transition must be also just in terms of financing, and this is important for us, because to finance the transition, we will need enough solidarity mechanism between the countries and between the rich and the poor. And this implies uh, also some fiscal justice, and this is an important element as well, I think. And then let me finish by saying uh, the different elements that we see are needed for a just transition. The first one, uh, I mentioned it earlier, it's solidarity mechanism to support the most vulnerable and affected sectors and regions. The second element is to have an adequate social protection. And we've seen it with the COVID-19 crisis that when there are big uh, changes, social protection is key to ensure that people uh, can adapt. Uh, the availability of training programs to accompany workers in their transition is also uh, crucial. Uh, a third element is the development of local economies and the diversification of activities to create other job opportunities for the workers. Um, a fourth element is uh, the need for socio-economic impact assessment and the development of long-term strategies so that the workers uh, don't have to change from one day to another but can anticipate the changes. And then the last element uh, for us, which is very crucial, is uh, to have an effective social dialogue and an inclusive process with a strong participation of workers at all stages of the process. And this is important, this social dialogue between trade unions and the, um, and the employers, because if you don't include the workers in the process, then you lack the, the necessary social acceptance to advance in this kind of climate policies. And you see it with uh, the Gilets Jaunes, but we have other examples. Um, I will stop here, but before to stop, I would like uh, to stimulate the discussion uh, to share my screen uh, and uh, to show you this. I don't know if you can see my screen. Yes. Uh, it's a title from The Guardian, and it's about a, a project uh, called the Beatrice uh, Project. It's an offshore wind farm project uh, in, that happened in, in Scotland. And The Guardian uh, pointed out that there uh, some migrant workers uh, were building this, wind, uh, this offshore wind uh, mill. And these migrant workers were paid below the minimum wage at uh, five pounds an hour. And I think uh, this is a perfect example to illustrate that transitioning to, to clean energy is not enough by itself, but we need a just transition that takes into account the workers as well. 
I'm happy to go deeper into the detail of the Just Transition Fund, etc., uh, with you, uh, but I will stop here my, my introduction. Excellent. Uh, let me also do, uh, uh, before I pass on the floor, if possible, I, let me just do some housekeeping, which I forgot, uh, and I apologize for this to, to do earlier. So um, just for the attendees, if you would like, uh, there is um, uh, in the, in, in our policy session, there will be a place for you to ask questions to our speakers, including Felix. Uh, so if any attendee would like to ask any question, could I please ask you to go to the Q&A tab Okay, and put in your question, write in, type in your question. Please ensure that if you have a specific person you would like to address the question to, that you identify that person in the question. So asking directly the question. Uh, let me remind also to other attendees that if they keep an eye on the Q&A um, tab, they can also vote and like questions that they feel would be uh, interesting. In this way, what we will try to do is we will try to uh, balance and try to pick the questions that most people have asked. Let me also finally tell you that we will, in any case, if we don't get to answer all questions, we will actually um, um, download the question and keep a record of them. So your, your, the speakers will hear from you. So it, I, I, I suggest you all um, ask uh, questions or, or input uh, things in the Q&A. And, uh, and then, uh, sorry for interrupting the flow of topic, but let me just give the floor to, uh, to Hannah, um, which I think is going to do a short presentation focused uh, spe uh, more specifically on the German case. Hannah, we cannot hear you. Can you try? Can you guys hear Anna? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, okay. yes, Great. yes, sorry. Okay, I don't know why it didn't work. Um... Okay, and now you should see my full screen. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Elena, for introducing me, and um, I'm very excited to present some of this research from the Call Exit Group here. And what I'll be talking about is the lessons that we can learn from the past phase out of coal in Germany. So we try to draw some historic lessons from the ongoing process because what most of you probably know is that Germany hasn't phased out coal yet. So this slide is just to meant to remind probably most of you and then to tell those of you who don't know that Germany uses both lignite and hard coal for electricity generation. So here you can see a map of the power plants. And then Germany also mines lignite still in three large areas in Germany. And historically, Germany has mined also hard coal in deep mines, but this ended in 2018. And the great thing about Germany is that it has these two different examples of phase out processes. And therefore, we're kind of capable of comparing two yeah, very different um, transition processes that happened. So this is the first one. This slide is on lignite in Germany and in the shaded areas what you can see is the amount of coal that has been mined over time and also the lines are the numbers of employees. And what you can see very yeah in a very illustrative way is this disruption that happened when Germany reunified in 1989. And here in only five years more than a hundred thousand people lost their jobs. So this was actually not a managed transition process, but this disruption. And then we have another process that was managed, and this is the decline of hard coal mining and the related employment in Germany. Again, you can see the development over time. And in the 1950s, Germany still mined more than 150 million tons of coal and 600,000 people were employed only in coal mining. And here in around 60 years also again all these people lost their jobs so 600,000 people in 60 years and what you can also see and i'll talk a little bit more in detail about this that this process was guided by a lot of policies structural policies that meant to guide the transition and the crucial element of these transi transition policies were three different areas. So the targeted workers specifically, then the regions and also the coal mining companies. And 
the other thing what you can see on the top line is that this support in these three different areas shifted from basically no support to trying to keep the industry alive so kind of conserving the industry then more structural systems more forward looking and lastly more holistic support so when we go towards the workers what happened is that since the early 1960s they got payments when they had to retire early or they got redundancy payments when they lost their jobs or for example they tried to shift workers from the coal mining industry towards the steel industry what also happened is that they got retraining and financial support to find a new job and more when they did manage to find a new job then in the next area for the regions and community in the beginning again no support in managing this this drastic decline in employment but since the late 1960s there were more and more subsidies to help the regions deal with this so for example they invested money in transport infrastructure so railroads and normal roads to increase mobility there were funds for economic reorientation diversification of the areas and very importantly there was money to for example build new universities or other research and training facilities money went also into recultivation and uh, what was very important in those areas was that the structural policies encouraged them to build clusters so that different cities work together in managing this process and not just the cities but also different companies and industries and then since the late 1960s this purely kind of economic focus on reorientation went towards what's called soft location factors so they also targeted cultural aspects of the areas recreational and environmental aspects and actually this helped the regions to move from a net minus migration so people moving away from those areas to people coming back and moving to those areas affected by the hardcore phase out and then the last area coal mining company, companies what was very special about the german case is that since the 19 um, the late 1950s but since the mid 60s imported coal was actually cheaper than the mined coal in germany and what the state did was they paid companies the price difference so that companies still bought coal mine coal mined in germany and not somewhere else and the companies also received other test tax cuts and financial aid what also happened is they got money when they actually modernized their mines, when they merged mines, when they actually reduced employment and for mine closures. So we can actually draw a lot of lessons already from these two cases. The first is that a just transition, at least in some way, for the coal workers in the coal regions related to hard coal mining was enabled by a lot of subsidies but this prevented an in-time transition by in-time transition we mean that is in line with climate protection targets this is not the case for the lignite example that i showed in the other slide and then policy recommendations that we drew from this was that for upcoming transition processes it's very important that governments refrain from subsidizing the coal industry itself for such a long time because like you can see in this German example this actually helped prolong this uh, process for a very long time although it was uneconomic then in those policies it's very important to consider long-term effects not just short-term ones and the impacts beyond the local communities where the mining happens or where the power plants are and then that it's very important to listen to external independent advice in addition to the incumbents so the mine firms or the power plant firms because they influence this process greatly and not the communities then what's important is there is no silver bullet in those areas they try to replace the big mining companies with other big companies that could take on all these jobs and this simply didn't work what's important is to include local stakeholders because first of all you can find better locally adapted solution but it also increases acceptance for those policies and changes and lastly it's also the german case is very illustrative for something that is happening in many countries this shift from coal to natural gas so the next fossil fuel use and this is actually 
justified also with the coal phase out process and in this process they give more public money to natural gas investments and we think this is something that should be considered very carefully if this is actually necessary and then my very last point i think um it has been mentioned actually before so with the current experiences that we have with the covid pandemic but also with for example the black lives matter protests in the us it's very important so that we include these considerations in just transition policies and that they do account for also gender aspects and racial impacts or in general minorities that are affected by this so thank you very much and i look forward to more questions and discussion later thank you very much hanna so um next on is uh, marian which uh, uh, will focus a little bit on uh, uh, research related to the just transition and uh, uh, workers uh, in the UK. Okay, hello. I uh, hope you can all hear me. Yes. yes. Um, great. Um, nice to be here. Thank you for Elena for organizing. Uh, so in, in this five, ten minutes, I'm uh, going to give you a brief overview of um, work I've uh, started to put together with uh, my colleague James Rising at the Grantham Research Institute. So unlike what Elena said, I'm not going to give you insights on the UK uh transition we're actually <laughs> um trying to to put together a comprehensive database of um of just transition policies that could serve that um, such that it could be uh serve to provide systematic empirical evidence for best practice in cost effectiveness of policies so it's rather ambitious and actually um the big question is you know why just coal what what's the limit of this what's the population of, of interest here of cases and some people you know you've mentioned automation all the way to automation but we have all different kinds of natural resource extraction but also things like palm oil you know different kinds of um so eventually if we if if, if we develop the right method to do this um you know we could have we could be gathering evidence and adapting policies as we go along for a very wide range of, of sectors, which I think is one of the you know, key um, research frontiers for sustainability research uh, in some ways. So we're starting with coal, so to get our feet wet. And um, so I'll give you an overview of the framework. We think we, um, we have that could work, but um, we're still waiting, waiting funding to do all the data collection. So I don't have results, um, but um, I would invite questions and challenges about, you know, our priorities and so on. So our goal is to remedy the fact that there is little comprehensive overview of policies and their outcomes in this area. There's a lot of different case studies floating around, which um, you know are going to be very, very important and interesting and the basis for all of this, but they tend to not you know, um, exactly put forward the same metrics or the same qualitative considerations and so on. Um, and oftentimes the evaluation of the interventions are not necessarily, you know, readily available or um, easily collated or... Um, so we would like to collect past policy experiences from case studies uh, and populate a database that would systematically be able to compare them uh, in a way that describes the policies, their context and their outcomes. Um, in a way that could serve, that can serve then for cost effectiveness analysis of these policies. Um, <clears throat> so there are many challenges here. Um, there, any of these regions that have had some form of managed transition or some policies to sort of repair the damage, there are many policies and interventions um, in one given area. And they uh, are targeted at different scales. Um, so it's hard to know where to draw the line. What's your unit of observation in terms of geography, scale of the policy, and so on, um, temporal scale. Um, the costs and benefits tend to be hard to translate across contexts. Um, and we have um, 
you know, it's, it, it is not, it really is a challenge in sort of doing violence to the data to build a common framework for all of this. And it can be difficult to collect the policy information. So our current sort of way of resolving some of these challenges, first in terms of defining our, our unit of observation is to think of the transition region, that we need to define transition regions uh, and then follow them over time. You know, I, I, I can think of years or a moving panel or something like this um, to build a panel. So uh, we're thinking um, in terms of administrative subdivision at the level uh, um, at the second level, so ADM two, kind of like nuts two for Europe. Um, that would be dense in, that are dense in coal mines with at least one episode of cl of closures with significant job losses since 1960. This is kind of like how we've um, scoped. Um, and so since there are many interventions that may happen and um, within that, you can then in, uh, combine the data on the different interventions at this level. And, and the benefit of using an administrative unit like this is then you can combine with other data on social welfare protection, on the industrial context, on the demographic context and so forth. Um, and on outcomes such as, you know, survey data on subjective well-being and um, employment. So um, we wanted to have an ontology of interventions, um, so that will be in the next slide, and we think it's important to combine quantitative and qualitative features here. Um, and for data collection, um, we, our, idea, our process that we'd like to go through is to do expert elicitation on each one of these regions that would help identify the most important interventions that occurred in any one of these regions, so we can then follow on with desk-based work on getting out the metrics, the, the total funding provided, the number of people targeted, and so on and so forth. Um, okay, so what information do we think is necessary to collect on any one of these, um, of these transitions and the policies that were, um, um, that, that were tried out? Um, first, at the level of the transition region, um, you know, to compare these correctly, we want to think about the drivers, whether this was like loss of competitiveness or depletion of mines um, or clean, like climate policy, uh, the time frame, the number of jobs lost, um, etc. Et and then the most important, like where we really need to, to do a lot of work is to get data on the intervention level. So uh, what I call an intervention is usually like there is some sort of funding program or some sort of consultation program targeted at a region. So which re region, what recipients, uh, what was the mechanism uh, that uh, targeted in terms of either development or retraining and so on, the funding body and the time frame. And we I think there are four important uh, sort of categories to get right here is like to think about um, um, how, uh, the sort of um, like support to, to the business community, the incumbent and the new, um, the support to the community, so land restoration, infrastructure, public services, support to individuals, so we talk about retraining, but oftentimes you have, you know, severance payments or pensions or social and health benefits, and then the, the governance process, um, as Felix was talking about. So, it, uh, you know, the, the, the levels of government involved, unions, business community, um, and the extent to which there was an active decision-making um, from these different actors. Uh, and then getting the quantitative metrics, you know, total funding and total jobs generated when the evaluation exists. So, um, not that easy to identify the regions. I mean, they're well known in, in some areas, like uh, um, in, in Europe, um, to some extent in the US, but um, what, we, what we try to do is to combine data on coal mine locations, so that's all the green dots, um, as well as commonly known mining regions, and then combine that with the jurisdictional uh, division. Um, in some areas of the world, it's very hard to get information on closure. Um, so, I mean, I started looking into China and it's like, you need to really go into provincial documents in Mandarin. Um, there have been many waves of closure. There's lots to learn from China, I think, for the development, the, the development context. 
um, where we have very dynamic, you know, regions that are growing in many directions. So pot potentially the transition looks very different than in mature re industrial regions of Europe. Uh, but getting the data on closures is, is a challenge, but uh, uh, it's not impossible. It just takes manpower. Um, so right now they're not coded, those regions, but I think, uh, um, you know, it's not just the areas of, of Europe and the U.S. That, that we can learn from. So as I said, our goal is to then have a basis for cost effectiveness analysis. So uh, if, since we, we're hoping to get a panel data from this, um, and associate data from administrative regions, then some of the questions we could be asking is, you know, how much does it seem to cost to save a job and how, how variable that is? And can we say something about the context that affects how, how, how variable that is? Um, are there institutional features that are highly predictive of the success of a policy? Um, and um, how much do you gain from um, having the complementary, complementary, you know, if you're just targeting individuals versus you're targeting businesses, community, and individuals, you know, are these additive or are these more than additive? Are these complements? Probably they're complements. It'd be nice to know, to, to understand some of those synergies. Um, all right. So, you know, we have framework. <laughs> We started populating it with our own means, but really we need like we need we need manpower for this. So we're hoping for collaborations and 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 funding to like move this forward. And and hopefully with with Elena, we're started discussing how to to make that happen. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm very much enjoying the insights of everybody on this panel. Thank you so much, uh, Marian. So I think next on the floor is uh, Jan. Hello everyone. So I'll share my screen. Uh, I, f I cannot share my screen because... because Marion, you have to uns unshare your screen first. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Thank I, you. I no worries. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, now it works. Okay. Do you see it now? Perfect. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you very much for, for giving me this opportunity to share a result, some of the results of my research. Um, so just to, just to manage your expectation, the, the, the presentation I'm going to give is mostly about showing the problem or the, 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 the nature of the problem and less about the solutions. And I hope very much for the you know, larger discussion about potential solutions. Uh, later uh, in the next part of the of the meeting. So let me start with this graph. It's showing the uh, it's showing the consumption of coal in future projected by integrated assessment models under the 1.5 degrees target. Um, the dotted line is for OECD. The solid line is the global consumption of coal. Uh, they are free for each because they are for different SSP scenarios. But the the, the the, the message I want to get you from here is about the time frame we have. So when you look at the, at the global consumption, uh, the solid lines show that we have 20 years from 2020 until 2040 to cut off I mean, the, the consumption of coal, production of coal, and in fact, all the employment in coal. Uh, for OECD countries, as even earlier, for countries like, like, like Poland, this part of OECD, we actually have 10 years to cut all the production and employment in the, uh, in the mining region. So in Poland, we have at the moment around 80,000 workers, uh, which will have to be moved. It's a pretty big mass of workers who has to be moved to other, to other regions. It's 80,000 workers that are directly working in the mining of the hard coal in Lignite, plus around 40,000 workers in industry that are somehow related, that are, that are supplying goods and services to the mining region. So they will be also affected. So it's a pretty large, big mass of workers. And just to give you some profile of those workers, on the left side, you see their demographics. The first, um, the, the, the first bar is showing you know, the percent, the, the share of each age group uh, among mining workers. And the first thing I wanted to point out is around 33% um, are above 45. And that's good news, because that means that that in 10 years, uh, they will be retired. The miners retire a bit earlier than others. So in 10 years, they will be retired and there is no need for them to look for a job. 
that's that, that that's good but there's still there are there is a 70 percent of workers who will be you know 30 40 and uh, they will have to find another job the second thing that i wanted to point out is their education and unfortunately the education of minors is pretty poor only 16 percent of, of minors have fired tertiary education comparing for example to 33 percent uh, when you look at the entire population of workers in Poland. So, you know, occasionally I sometimes see the miners that, that, that uh, at some conferences, I see the, the photos of miners who got training and they are, they, they, they are in the IT sector programming. So, well, yes, that could happen sometimes, but not on a large scale. When I look at this, uh, at this graph on the right hand side, you know, only a small fraction of them will get, uh, will, will be able to get uh, well paid jobs in, in IT or banking sector. And certainly most of them, uh, we'll have to go to the construction sector or manufacturing sector or, or, or simple services sector. Um, so now I'm probably in the, at a point to, to, to give you the central, my central message. Um, moving those workers from one sector to the other sector will involve a real cost, real loss of their welfare. This is going to be a real cost. And in my view, our literature still put too little effort in order to understand what this cost is and then how to quantify that. Uh, so let me first give you um, a very simple economic uh, argument. Where is this loss? Where is this cost coming from? So imagine in front of you a miner who will be usually a big guy around 30 years old, 35. Given his education that he received, given the, the experience that he accumulated over years, given his network, given his preferences, attitudes, this miner chose to work in mining. This, he, this is the, the sector of his choice. Assuming that he's rational, this means that from all sectors, mining gives him the highest payoff. Um, it's his first best. If we take away this option from him, he can't work there. He has to go to his second best. And moving all, always moving from first best to second best involves some uh, some loss. It's a very simple economic um, economic uh, argument. And now I wanted to to go a little bit in more detail. How come mining could be a first best for for for, for any worker? And first um, first answer to that is this graph. So that's a wage distribution in the mining sector versus wage distribution manufacturing. And what you see is that the median, uh, median um, salary in the mining sector is around twice as high as the one in manufacturing. Okay, so yeah, basically there are few workers in mining that earn less than, than workers in manufacturing. And yeah, this is true that partially the, the reason why they earn so much is that those workers here in the mining, they have very high human capital because uh, the training that they got, because of the accumulation of experience they had, they are pretty productive. The, the human capital is, is, is pretty productive. But the problem is that this human capital is sector specific, it's specific to mining. If they move to another sector, they can't use the human capital as productive, uh, in the same productive way as they did. So probably the miners work uh, from here are moving to manufacturing, they will not get the same salary. They'll probably end up um, they will end up uh, somewhere here with probably half the wage they got before. The second, um, the second big reason why mining is the first choice for many workers um, is as follows. So probably when I ask you a question, do you prefer to work for 2000 euros in extremely hard, dangerous uh, physical work, uh, they, they have 40 degrees when they work there, and they have really hard physical work. Or do you want to get 1,000 euros in, in, in grocery? Then many of us, including me, probably would choose that we prefer to work in grocery shop. But miners are very different from us. So that, that you have to realize that they, you can't use too much empathy. They are, they, they, are, they are different. From the early childhood, from the kindergarten, they were taught by teachers, parents, grandparents that mining is a noble thing. Being a miner is noble. And they were very often taught and taught that their hard work is absolutely critical for the functioning of the entire country. Actually, this is often linked even with patriotism. So, so 
you and 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 it's deeply rooted in them. You can go and make the motivational talk, but I bet it will not work. They they really believe that their job as a miner is really important. Okay, and they will you know psychologically they will refuse to 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 accept the other the other narrative. Um, now I wanted to 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 tell you something about quantifying this cause. So Elena asked me many times, this is a policy session, but please don't be too technical. So I'll try to be, to, to, to fit my, the, the technical details just in one sentence. Um, we try to quantify the, this loss uh, by taking the, you, the, the, the random utility model from consumer theory, adopting it to the choice uh, of, of, um, of workers, calibrating to, to the elasticity of supply at the firm and industry level, and then merging it with the CGE model, the competition during equilibrium model, to, ask, to estimate so what is exactly the monetary loss of uh, those workers. So we, we ran a scenario with the 80% reduction of emissions uh, by, 20, uh, by 2050. In this scenario, basically, we get that the Polish mining sector has to be um, phased out by late, uh, late 30s. And this is associated uh, with the loss, which can be quantified as quarter of the percent uh, of GDP already in 2040. So this quarter percent of GDP every year. Is it a lot? Um, actually, it's not huge. It's, it's, it's manageable. But it's also something that, um, that perhaps we shouldn't ignore. And um, just two words about just transition funds. So just transition fund is a mechanism that can potentially uh, cover this loss, uh, compensate miners, but there are still a lot of things we don't know about the fund, um, how it's going to work and how it's going to affect other, 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 other uh, funds. So one thing you have to keep in mind is that there are a lot of structural funds uh, coming from EU to the poor regions in Poland in order to, to, to make them develop, and, um, and there is still no, it's still not clear what will happen to those funds. Is it, we don't know whether the just transition fund just implies moving the funds from the poorest regions, the mining regions, which by the way are not the poorest in Poland, because in this case, just transition fund wouldn't be really just. Uh, so so I, don't, I don't want to act, accuse, uh, maybe, the, maybe the, 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 it's going really to work, but we have to you know, look at, at it in the context and make sure that the healthy miners will not be at the expense of other, other poor regions, not only in Poland, but, but also in the entire in entire Europe. Um, Elena, how much time I have? Am I done? You're doing great. I mean, uh, this is all very interesting. Uh, if you need to finish, uh, go on and, and let's do that. I think you're pretty so, much... So, so, uh, yeah, so maybe just one sentence. I started with integrated assessment models, so maybe I'll finish with them. Uh, integrated assessment models, you know, they are, they, they are designed in order to, to uh, in order to um, uh, to predict, to project the optimal transition pathways and to estimate their costs. And in case you wonder whether when in the, in the, the cost estimate that they provide, does this cost include the, uh, the, the cost of moving workers from one sector to the other? The answer is no, they don't. And it's not to downgrade the, the, the integrated assessment models. They are really important and, and very valuable. Uh, but keep in mind, they take into account many, many, many efforts, but they don't take into account uh, that one. And I hope that you have a, a discussion, larger discussion about the potential solutions later during the meeting. Thank you. Jan, thank you so much. I think you did not only very well in staying away from two technical details, just one sentence of elasticity of substitution, which is uh, amazing for him, as I've known him for years. But uh, I think that it's actually, it's really important to raise this research questions. And I think this is a good thing to do it at this table where we have people that come at it from different perspective and with different interests. I think that it's a very, very, um, I mean, it's really enriching the conversation. Um, so without further ado, I guess, let me just uh, move on. So right now we're switching a little bit perspective. Uh, we are at IRI, the European conference. So we designed the policy session to be focused around Europe in the initial part, because this is uh, our home, basically, uh, the, the home of many of us. But let's not forget that, um, when we were looking at the map before, we saw that there, are, there, was a, there were a lot of closures, a lot of mining and a lot of closures in the US as well, right? So while I, um, I will challenge people on the topic raised before that we can not only learn from Europe and the US, uh, now it is the time to move to our two last presentations by Jake and Wes.
Jake is going to go first and uh, um, present some uh, um, insights on the policy landscape in the US and how the US frames the, uh, the discourse around the just transition and or policies to support workers and communities uh, in the transition toward cleaner, uh, cleaner energy and a more sustainable economy. And then Wes uh, will, follow, will follow. So I, I assume you guys have a sort of flow going. So if it's okay with you, I will just introduce you now and then you will go straight to the end. Is that, does that work? Sounds great. Okay, the floor, the floor is yours. Awesome. Um, let me share my screen real quick. Great. Uh, thank you, Ona, uh, for, for the introduction. Um, and it's great to be here with all of you. Um, I've, I've enjoyed learning a lot about uh, the uh, European context. And I think those of us who, who work um, in the US context have a lot to learn from uh, the research and policy work being done in Europe uh, to ensure that workers and communities not just uh, are able to survive, but able to thrive in the transition to a cleaner economy. Uh, my name is Jake Higdon. Um, as Elena said, I'm a senior analyst uh, focused on U.S. climate policy at Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, EDF is a non-governmental organization that brings together economics, science, and policy to tackle environmental challenges. Um, and I'm going to spend the next few minutes sort of setting, setting a little bit of the stage around the U.S. political and economic context and where the conversation is at this particular moment on issues of just transition um, and then I'll hand it over to my colleague, Wes Look, at Resources for the Future to discuss uh, the research that the, our two organizations are collaborating on at this moment. Um, and, you know, before, before I, I dive in, one of the things that sort of struck me as listening to um, uh, the, the other panelists is um, the kind of assumptions we make about how self-evident um, or inevitable this this transition is, and um, I think that's a that's a very challenging political issue in the U.S. Um, Felix, you know, made the point, which I think many of us would, would agree with, that um, it's sort of clear that there's no jobs on a dead planet. Um, but I think in the U.S. political discourse, um, that's not always treated as as self-evident, and we have to look sort of no further than. Um, our current president running uh, in his 2016 campaign on bringing back coal jobs and on withdrawing from the Paris Agreement uh, to see evidence of that. Um, there's also a lot of sort of pushback in the U.S. context on the just transition uh, terminology itself. Um, and, and I think that there are some, uh, some clear reasons for that. In coal communities uh, that have seen kind of sustained disinvestment uh, for a long time, for decades. Um, transition or, or the concept of just transition is, is sometimes thought of as sort of a, a quote unquote fancy funeral, um, sort of a veneer that's being put over um, our plans to continue to disinvest and to abandon these communities. And I, I think that that distrust is, is very justified in the US context. Uh, for a long time, workers in coal communities have seen families and friends lose their jobs um, and uh, there's been very little support flowing into these communities. Um, in, in a very different way, uh, the oil and gas industry um, is not uh, always keen to discuss transition because the past 10 years in the U.S. have seen um, record levels of production in oil and gas. The, the industry has benefited from the shale revolution um, and then 2020 was poised to become, to make the U.S. a net exporter of oil. Um, and so it's very challenging to discuss transition for a, an industry that still feels that it's very much on the rise. Um, and all of this is, is complicated by kind of the political economy of fossil fuels in the United States. Um, and, and many of these features are true in the European context as well, but um, the US political system um, in terms of the electoral college, um, the fact that um, every state, regardless of size, gets equal representation in the U.S. Senate, means that um, many rural regions with high levels of fossil fuel production um, and maybe lower um, populations have sort of an outsized political impact um, relative to, to their population. Um, and so fossil fuels have long sort of loomed large in the political consciousness of the U.S. 
Um, and you know, an example of that is, is the fact that the most powerful um, Democrat on energy issues in the U.S. Senate is, is Joe Manchin, who comes from West Virginia, um, a major coal producing state. Um, so, so sort of beyond the, the moral imperative of addressing this issue, there is a political imperative uh, to really provide substance around just transition uh, in the U.S. context uh, to be able to pass ambitious climate policy that we need. Um, and I think that climate advocates um, haven't done ourselves any favors throughout history in sort of oversimplifying or, or sometimes outright ignoring the challenges faced by fossil fuel communities. Um, Jan was just talking about uh, the high paying jobs in the coal sector in Poland um, and the difficulty of switching between those jobs and other industries and, and Felix highlighted um, sort of the, the low wages on uh, green jobs as well. And I think that um, environmental advocates in the U.S. have kind of long sort of uh, waved their hands about uh, the ability to provide green jobs in, in coal communities without doing the hard work of figuring out what policies um, and interventions are really necessary to um, provide the ability for workers to, to stay in their location and, and to uh, utilize their existing skill set to achieve sort of family sustaining wages with high labor standards in the new clean economy. So that's, that's a shortfall I think we, we kind of recognize as EDF and um, we're hoping to conduct this new research as a way to build out a, a more comprehensive policy roadmap at the federal level for U.S. policymakers to provide support for workers and communities. So regardless of those kind of political headwinds, um, the transition is occurring in the U.S. And, and coal plants and mines have been shutting down at a rapid pace. Uh, we've seen an increase over the past decade in, in annual retirements of coal generation. Uh, we've also seen a continuation of the long-standing trend of the decline in coal mining jobs in the U.S. Um, that's been going on sort of throughout the 20th century. Um, and and uh, even this year alone, we've lost an additional 5,000 jobs since January. Um, and the current pandemic is accelerating that trend. Uh, and the U.S. government anticipates that coal demand will decline an additional 25% this year. Um, and that comes at a real sort of cost for uh, workers in the U.S., but also for communities. Um, coal plant retirements and mine closures impact community budgets um, and sort of uh, create challenges for communities to provide essential services. Um, and many coal communities sort of lag behind the rest of the U.S. in terms of um, public health indicators, educational attainment levels, um, and other factors in no small part because they've seen this longstanding disinvestment. Um, over the years. And this is a map of all of the coal plants that are retired in the U.S. Um, and there are nearly 500 counties that depend in one way or another on the coal economy in the United States. Um, an example that's sort of on the extreme end of the, expect the spectrum is Boone County, West Virginia, um, which over the course of just six years um, lost one third of its uh, county tax base between 2012 and 2018 as 70% of coal production in the county shut down. So with sort of the, the continuing economic pain in coal communities um, and the, um, the, the need and urgency around um, actually moving towards national climate policy in the US, I do think that the just transition conversation is moving in a really positive direction from something that was maybe confined to communities and regions impacted um, and moving onto the national stage, really on all ends of the political spectrum, um, from, from more conservative um, uh, folks in, in the U.S. Congress to uh, more progressive ones, it's, uh, just transition is an issue that's, that's tackled in uh, the Green New Deal and more progressive approaches in the United States. Um, and this has really been driven up by, bo driven by bottom up stakeholder processes. Uh, the Just Transition Fund is one such organization that's been working with communities to develop recommendations for federal policies that can meet their needs um, as we transition away from coal. Uh, the Blue-Green Alliance, uh, which is an organization of environmental and labor stakeholders, uh, which includes Environmental Defense Fund, um, is also working on a platform for federal policymakers in this space right now. And as that kind of push from the bottom up occurs, there's been a similar pull from the legislature in the U.S. Uh, for the first time in, in more than a decade, a major uh, committee in U.S. Congress, the Energy and Commerce Committee in the House of Representatives, has released a comprehensive climate policy framework um, that includes a section on worker transition. Um, and there have been sort of requests from members of Congress 
to um, uh, uh, provide more policy substance around what these communities really need. Uh, similarly, in the coronavirus relief and stimulus conversations, uh, members of Congress have been calling for ideas uh, to support fossil fuel communities, both in terms of immediate relief and in terms of long-term recovery. And so kind of in the middle of this, this discourse, um, my organization, EDF, uh, believes there's a role for environmental groups like us to, to step into this place a little bit more um, ambitiously um, and to hopefully complement and augment the bottom-up and crucial stakeholder processes that are being uh, undergone with our partners at Blue Green Alliance and elsewhere um, and help use our advocacy levers to translate those into um, national political action. And uh, we've sort of thought that there's, there's no better partner in that effort than Resources for the Future, which brings a ton of environmental economic expertise to help us dig into um, which policies are most effective uh, coming from the federal level at supporting community needs and ensuring uh, this just transition for workers as we move to a clean economy. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Wes to talk about what that research looks like and the role we're playing in this space. Great. Thank you, Jake. One moment while I share my screen. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so Jake outlined the policy context in the United States very well, um, which as he indicated is the <clears throat> Um, the focus of the research that we have developed and are um, conducting currently and in partnership with um, Elena and, and, and others. Um, so I'll be, I'll be talking at a very high level um, for the next 10 minutes about that research just to um, inform this group and, and to um, hopefully try to contribute some insights to the dialogue. So the research is looking at policies for ensuring fairness for workers and communities in the context of decarbonization or what we might refer to as, as just transition. This work is being conducted in partnership, as Jake mentioned, <clears throat> and as we've talked about a couple of times, between Resources for the Future, uh, the Environmental Defense Fund, and the RFF CMCC partnership, European Institute on Economics and the Environment. So first of all, a very high level um, <clears throat> uh, rendition of the work that we're conducting. Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, we are aiming to do a review of, and this is very um, similar or um, overlapping, Marianne, with I think what you've conceived of and what a number of people are working on here, but I've already, uh, I think this session has provided for me um, a number of important um, insights about potential collaboration. Um, but so what we have sort of in the first box here on the left hand side of the screen, um, just pointing to this work where we'll, we're looking at European and US just transition policies. Um, this is largely qualitative work. I'll, I'll talk about this a bit more. Um, we're also doing case studies on individual um, community industrial transitions. Um, we've got three specific case studies, which I'll provide some more information on. <clears throat> and then we're doing um, a deep dive on a particularly central policy in the United States called the Power Initiative, um, where we'll, we're not only talking about sort of a, doing a qualitative review and rendition of that policy, but um, doing some quantitative analysis and evaluation of the efficacy of that policy. And then we also, at RFF in particular, um, have a commitment to being kind of a rapid response Response, rapid response research resource for U.S. Congress um, policymakers in the, in, the, in the midst of, as we are all familiar with probably in our various capacities, in the midst of a policymaking process, oftentimes we'll have um, questions that arise um, that require research that are quite timely. So we've structured um, some of our, um, our, our capacity to be responsive to that. So the research on, um, I'm gonna focus on the US just transition policies in this presentation. Um, <clears throat> Elena having spoken some about our, our European work. Um, <clears throat> but what we're doing first of all is that we're, we're breaking up um, US policies related to just transition 
um, into four main buckets. Um, so we intend to produce reports on um, each of these four topics and then a final synthesis of, um, of those topics. Those topics are um, economic development, so looking at policies and programs implemented by the federal government primarily in the United States, but also, which is our national government, I know, um, um, in some in Germany in particular, federal refers to the subnational, and the U.S. federal, of course, refers to the national level policy, and then state is our subnational policy. Um, <clears throat> so our national policy um, is primarily what we're looking at, but also looking in some instances at state policies aimed at facilitating all in, in all of these areas. But so first, we look at policies that are targeting um, broad spread broad spread economic development, which is a very large category um, and as Marian mentioned you know one of the challenges with this type of research is how do you draw your boundaries um, when identifying sort of the relevant policies um, but we start with economic development then we look at policies um, targeted at workforce support so largely workforce development workforce training programs um, but also looking at labor standards a key component of supporting uh, labor and protecting labor the third bucket is looking at policies that um, <clears throat> are facilitating the development of energy infrastructure in one way or another. So um, uh, an example, perhaps one of the more prominent policies in the United States are our clean energy tax credits, production tax credit and invest investment tax credit policies um, aimed at deploying um, renewable energy. We also in this category are looking at policies um, uh, designed to facilitate environmental remediation in the context of um, the, the decommissioning or closure of various industrial operations, the closure of a coal mine, the decommissioning of a coal plant, et cetera. So environmental remediation this is not sort of environmental policy broadly, but remediation in the context of deindustrialization. And then another very broad um, category is public policy to support the development of infrastructure. This is, um, you know, standard infrastructure. So roads, bridges, um, electricity infrastructure, <clears throat> uh, et cetera, water infrastructure. The fourth um, policy uh, analysis area that we are focusing on <clears throat> is public benefits and health. And some of this is also very broad. So looking at um, fundamental social safety net policies in the United States like unemployment insurance or social, sec social security, Medicaid, Medicare, um, the publicly subsidized health care programs in the United States, but then also looking at some of the what we might call benefit policies that are more targeted on um, coal and fossil fuel production uh, communities. And uh, the sort of primary example that I think of in, in that category is the Black Lung Liability Trust Fund which is a policy aimed at providing public, uh, at, at providing health benefits to uh, coal miners who suffer from silicosis or black lung disease, as well as economic or financial supports to their families. So these, in, in, in sort of each of these areas, we have, I would say somewhere between 10 and 20 policies identified. We have outlined most of those policies at this point, um, are aiming to publish these four reports um, sometime this summer. So much of this work is, has been well underway this year and, and will hopefully be coming out sometime soon. And then, as I mentioned, uh, we have a final synthesis that will wrap all of this together, uh, at which point we'll do um, a taxonomy to try to rationalize the, um, the policy landscape for policymakers. Um, <clears throat> to give a little bit more detail on what we're looking at when we consider each of these individual policies that I um, that fit within those four categories I just discussed. Um, we start with looking at um, the theoret theoretical policy justifications for given policy interventions. So this is drawing from primarily economic literature that identifies a perhaps a market failure or um, some other basis for intervention um, by the by the by public public entities or the government. We also then just get into the nitty gritty of how the policies are structured. Um, so this um, unpacks the various mechanisms that are <laughs> included in a policy or program, be it workforce training programs, um, uh, technical assistance for small businesses, grant programs, et cetera. Uh, within that context, we look at administrative structure. So getting at well, how, um, 
how are these programs being delivered um, administratively, <clears throat> which is an important question in the context of process, which has been touched on a couple of a couple of times um, today, which I, I also see as essential in the context of just transition, having just process as well. Um, we also look at the, the, the funding levels from government, um, primarily for our, our national policies. We look at federal appropriations. Um, and then where, where, there is, um, where there are existing analyses of the impacts of these policies, we also are reviewing that literature. Um, you know, as, as you can imagine, we've got about somewhere between 60 and 100 policies that we're looking at. We don't have the capacity at this point in time to be doing a robust qualitative analysis of the efficacy of those policies. And so we're just drawing from the literature. Um, as I'll talk about in a moment, we are teeing up some of that um, evaluation work ourselves in, on the power initiative policies, but for the most part, we're deferring to existing literature. Um, we also have developed, I mentioned this taxonomy, and this is just a, um, a graphic here. Um, that is sort of our first cut at the taxonomy in the context of economic development policies. Very simple. Um, we're hoping to develop a more robust taxonomy in the context of um, the synthesis report. Try to accelerate my presentation here a little bit. I just got a couple more slides. The case studies is a, the second component of our research. Um, we have three case studies that we currently have underway. So again, this is looking at how individual communities are navigating industrial or energy transition in the United States, where we're going, we're doing interviews with community members, we're gathering um, site-specific data to tell the story of <clears throat> what led to the closure or the transition and then how has, it been, um, how has it been facilitated. And that's looking at it from the perspective of workers, from the perspective of the regional economy, from the fiscal perspective, school districts, local governments, so looking, taking a sort of manifold approach at assessing that transition. Um, so the three case studies we have underway are <clears throat> first in Coal Strip, Montana, um, where a four-unit coal plant has really provided the backbone of the economy for decades, and two of those four units just closed earlier this year, um, really blowing a hole in the economy in Coal Strip. Coal Strip is one of the largest um, coal-fired electricity units in the West in general, so it also is crucial to the electricity system in the Intermountain West. Um, <clears throat> the second uh, case study is um, looking at a sort of um, manifold deindustrial case, um, in, which is um, looking at the economic transition in Athens, Ohio, in the middle of the country. Um, <clears throat> Athens uh, has within about a 40 mile radius of it um, six, I believe it is six coal mines and did have um, four coal plants, all of which have closed in the last decade. Um, there also have been steel mills that have gone through decline. So there's, there's a number of different um, um, vectors of deindustrialization in Athens. And it's a place where there's been a great deal of federal or again, national policy intervention. So it's a place where we can look at the um, eff efficacy of those national policies. The third case study is looking at the closure of a, another coal-fired generating station called the Huntley Generating Station based in Tonawanda, New York. Um, <clears throat> one of the interesting lessons to be learned from this case is process. It's a place where there's been a particularly robust um, um, diverse stakeholder engagement and coalition development process between labor, environmental organizations, local government, um, and teachers unions um, that has then developed um, partnership with state legislatures um, in the state of New York. Uh, so, and also the, the Tonawanda um, Huntley plant um, provided a really, really provided a functional, crucial role for the entire industrial economy in the region. And so there are a number of um, insights that we're drawing from that. <clears throat> so um, I mentioned we're also doing a deep dive on what is really, I think, the, the most important and salient just transition policy package in the United States to date. It's the, the POWER initiative, um, which stands for <clears throat> Partnerships for Opportunity and Workforce and Economic Revitalization Initiative. So that's a bit of a mouthful, uh, which was a, launched by the Obama administration in 2015 as part of a broader package called Power Plus, um, which received partial backing through appropriations um, in 2016, the fiscal year 2016 package. Um, this is similar to the approach with the EU Green Deal. The Power Initiative is a, was essentially an effort to 
um, <clears throat> focus existing policies and programs at the national level on the transition issue. Um, so it's largely drawing from existing resources. And how do I get back to my screen there? Um, <clears throat> so here we're looking at, we're, we're basically aiming to, to provide a description of the power initiative, which was this omnibus um, initiative that brought together 10 different agencies, uh, or maybe a bit more, 10 to 12 different agencies. Um, and so looking at that interagency coordination, helping the policy audience um, understand how that was structured, but then looking at how it's been implemented, um, how the, what the different um, individual programs um, actually executed, the funding levels that they executed, how it was distributed geographically, um, how it was distributed in terms of project type, uh, and then developing a system of metrics um, to evaluate the efficacy of those programs. Lastly, I mentioned we have this aim to be a rapid response research resource for, um, for the US Congress as it goes through this um, challenging and essential process of developing robust just transition policy. And that is, uh, I think, a, a good point to close to bring it back to the comments that Jake made that this research is very focused on the, 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 active, and, um, uh, the active process of developing public policy um, that could be of unpre unprecedented levels of public funding because of primarily the stimulus um, in the COVID context and also this need that people are finally coming to realize hopefully in the United States as well that we need to decarbonize our economy. So thank you very much. Well, thank you all. Uh, thanks. Um, I think uh, as I was mentioning before, I think that uh, um, this first part of the of the policy session actually put on um, on the table a lot of the issues and what I particularly appreciated from my point of view is the fact that we as I was mentioning before we have different perspectives coming to the table right we have on the one hand the, the trade unions which have a very practical I think uh, approach and, uh, and an important constituency there uh, we also have researchers that focus more on policy, let's say, um, uh, policy insight, qualitative methods, and then we go all the way from uh, to the presentation, which tries to embed uh, uh, more complex or more um, uh, uh, more difficult uh, uh, to 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 disentangle um, methods such as integrated assessment model. I mean, to be honest, I think uh, uh, for me, this is actually the beginning of what I hope will be a process of uh, uh, you know, co-creation and collaboration in, uh, in the hopes of building uh, uh, more robust insights to help really both Europe, the US and, and possibly and perhaps also other countries outside of these two uh, uh, geographical areas uh, push for a transition which is not only clean but it's also as we said before just. Right. So I know that uh, we I'm very aware of the time. We have another 20 minutes until the end of the session. So what I propose to do now in order to sort of uh, start a little bit of this conversation is I would like I'm going to share my screen and I would like to ask uh, each of the panelists uh, specific questions. So I will, uh, if, if you don't mind, I will uh, sort of pick on you guys, right? I've identified uh, some questions which uh, I think are interesting to start a conversation. And uh, I've identified also speakers which I think would be the uh, better positioned one to answer some of these questions. This does not mean that uh, um, I, uh, I think everybody can offer their own insights here. And I think all insights would be really rich. But in the interest of moving on, I will simply pick on two people and then we'll see how we go from there, okay? So let me do it this way. I have a first, uh, let's say, set of questions for the round table, which I think is an interesting one. And my first question, I think I'm going to pick on Felix. Uh, and first and second question. Um, what I would be interested in understanding and what I think the research community really needs to hear, it really needs to hear this, is uh, what is your perspective? From your point of view, what effect has this transition away from fossil fuel had on workers in the past? on communities uh, um, and on regions up to date, and what uh, will be different in the future? Will it be of the same, uh, you know, with the same speed? Will it be of the same type? Will the challenges be bigger, right? And in this context, uh, I think that it is important also to ask uh, 
what do you believe are the most important elements of the support for workers and communities? I know you touched very briefly upon this in your presentation, and I thank you for raising the ball there, I think. But if you were to talk about the different elements and sort of think about which one should a policymaker prioritize, which one should a researcher worry most in the research, what would you say? And uh, so I will pick on you and I will also ask at the same time, if Jake doesn't mind, the same questions to Jake, because I think it would be interesting to see whether coming from the US perspective as a different, uh, brings a, a different um, you know, insights to the table. So um, uh, please, Felix, if you don't mind, and then Jake, uh, I'll, I'll give you the floor on this. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, th thanks to all of the previous speakers, because I, I had some very interesting perspective as well that I'm also not always used to. So it's also good for me to, to interact with researcher and, and I really value this. Um, to answer your question, uh, I mean, you had uh, a lot of questions, but I will try to touch upon the different effects uh, that the transition can be, uh, can have uh, to move away from fossil fuels. Let's start with the positive ones. Uh, I think that in some cases uh, and in some countries and regions, the transition towards clean energies uh, translated into new opportunities and better jobs and, and, and better, uh, better economic developments. And I'm thinking here about, for example, uh, Den the case of Denmark, uh, which is now a leader in, in renewables and, and is, is really, I mean, uh, is really a leader in that perspective and it, it has created employment and, and high economic value on this, which has come also to the workers. Then there, there are other cases uh, where there are, which are less uh, positive and where you can see either a rise in unemployment uh, due to restructuring or closing of the industries or sometimes a relocation of activities to abroad. Uh, where the cost of the um, of the workers are are, are less and and there there is less um, strengthen, stringent environmental standards or you can also have another reaction which is more the case in poland and bulgaria for example where no climate action is taken simply because there is no public support for it uh, for the reason that we discussed before and by the way this discussion is happening also within the trade union movement and, and I think uh, this is important to, to, to keep in mind as well. Um, I would add to that that it's we should be careful that uh, the, the new employment in new clean energy sectors almost never coincide really with uh, the regions where the high carbon intensity are. And, and this should be kept in mind because especially in Europe, uh, we see that Denmark, Sweden, etc. are very uh, proactive in adopting uh, uh, higher uh, targets for climate, but this also reflects the fact that these economies will benefit the most from the opportunities from it. And I think we should, we should keep that in mind as well. Uh, and then uh, we should also be uh, careful to the working conditions in renewable sectors, uh, as I mentioned before, that are sometimes worse than in fossil fuel sectors. Um, so these are for me the different effects that it could have. Uh, now the most important element uh, to support uh, for workers. First of all, there is a need to create job opportunities in these specific regions uh, that have uh, high carbon intensive industries. Uh, but we should also not forget that some of these carbon intensive industries are needed for the transition. And here I insist on the fact that to build windmills, solar panels and building renovations, it will require uh, steel, cement, aluminium, uh, for example, which are all very polluting industries. And at the moment, uh, there are no big, there are no not really advanced technologically to produce these elements uh, in, a, in a green way, let's say. So this, we should be careful to that. And then, uh, I mean, in parallel to that, I think to achieve a just transition, we should not talk only about environmental uh, uh, reduction of greenhouse gas emission, but also uh, the need to raise the standards for working condition, uh, to, to develop the discussion on minimum wages, for example, and that would, I think, be an answer to the case that we were discussing below uh, uh, before on the, the Polish workers. And I think all these societal uh, policies should be linked now with, with climate policies, and that's an important aspect. The health and safety uh, as well is a very important discussion. Uh, you mentioned that Polish workers are more better paid than the others, 
but I think this uh, better pay is also reflect the fact that they risk more their lives by going to work uh, than, than other workers as well. Um, and then uh, finally, my final point is the need for redistributions. Uh, those regions that I were mentioning, that I was mentioning, uh, that will benefit from the transition should contribute more to the EU budget, for example, uh, to support the other regions. And the same goes as well for the people within society. Uh, the people who have high wages should also bear in mind that if they want to live in a world uh, where uh, they can still have a job uh, and they don't need to work under uh, 41 degrees, then they should also uh, make sure that there is redistribution and fiscal policies uh, to, to help uh, those most vulnerable. So that would be my, my input on this. Thank you, thank you. So Jake, do you, uh, can you bring the US uh, perhaps perspective on this? Would you agree, disagree, or see different uh, you know, components as more heavy, uh, weighing more heavily uh, with respect to what Felix said? Yeah, I, I would um, agree with really everything that, that Felix said and, and just kind of emphasize some of the points that I made earlier with respect to sort of the, the dependence that many communities have in the US on fossil fuels as a portion of their tax base and the challenges that many communities have been facing for years um, with sort of the risk of fiscal collapse and the ability to provide essential services. Um, and I would also kind of add that communities, coal communities in particular that have seen disinvestment and the transition away from fossil fuels to date um, also still have many of the kind of existing scars physical land scars on, on their landscapes from uh, the extractive economy. And so the US has um, tens of thousands of ab abandoned mines and orphan oil and gas wells um, that are also creating challenges for communities um, because they influence uh, water quality and the ability to attract new investment and new industries into these regions. Um, in, my, uh, in my earlier remarks, I mentioned that there are around 500 counties in the US that have seen a coal plant closure within the past 20 years. Um, and there are about um, 350 counties today that still have coal plants or coal mines within their jurisdiction and so have something to lose in the transition to a clean economy. And I think um, if, we, if we hope to meet our climate targets and move to a 100% clean economy, those communities will see sort of the losses of these facilities. Um, and many of those communities are the same ones that have seen closures historically as well. So it creates kind of a cumulative effect. Um, and I think that it, it's important um, for policymakers to continue the cumulative, to consider the cumulative burden uh, that these communities face. That, that's something that we talk about in the context of environmental justice issues um, and the cumulative impacts of pollution. Um, uh, on, on communities of color and low income communities, but it's also true in the, the just transition context. We can't simply address um, the, the plant closure that happens this year. Um, we have to recognize that communities and regions have been dealing with this disinvestment for a long period of time and the effects compound. Um, and then the last thing I'll just note is that as we move to a 100% clean economy, uh, the US, the impact of the transition will go beyond coal in the US in ways that I don't think um, we've necessarily grappled with yet. And I mentioned the fact that the oil and gas industry is experiencing or has been experiencing a boom. Um, there will be sort of economic pain to come in oil and gas communities as well. Um, and that means a very different sort of geographic footprint, a different worker skill set, um, and, and new challenges to come as those communities, uh, which are potentially somewhat overlap with coal communities, but, but definitely don't entirely um, feel kind of the burden of the shift. Thank now, you. Could Thank I just add a few comments there also yes. on the U.S. context? Um, so first of all, I just wanted to underscore what Felix said about raising the quality of jobs in a clean energy economy. Um, that is definitely a problem in the United States as well. And so establishing um, establishing high standards of labor in the clean energy economy and also frankly I think that some in the labor community feel that it may be um, difficult to achieve but um, a very valuable contribution would be to unionize labor in the clean energy economy. The, the percentage of unionized jobs in the fossil fuel um, industry is much much higher um, than 
uh, basically almost zero unionized jobs in the clean energy space. And <clears throat> that's sort of like a fundamental flaw um, when we talk about this transition. And so being honest and clear eyed about that, that and the challenges there. Um, uh, and then the other thing I wanted to do was to just sort of flag something that you had raised, Elena, in your presentation, and that is the compounding effects of disruptive forces. Um, so decarbonization, but also increased digitalization. And I think that when we look at the 100% clean energy economy, we're also looking at um, the deployment of various uh, technologies, including AI, that are part of increasing the efficiency at a macro scale of the economy. Um, and so we need to be considering that kind of compounding effect. And then lastly, um, I think transitions, um, and maybe this is a, a segue to your next question, most important elements of support for workers. Um, transitions in the future, I think, need to do a better job, at least in the United States, of um, robustly engaging the impacted communities throughout the process. And that's the workers as well as the communities in these areas where deindustrial deindustrialization is happening. And there's quite a bit of active conversation in that, uh, on that topic in the United States right now. How do you really design a, a, a administrative structure that runs from the, the stratosphere of the national government through the state governments down to community-based organizations um, such that their, th that community base has a role in designing policies and seeing how policies are implemented, um, et cetera. Thank you, Wes. I think, I mean, just to um, uh, sort of like uh, um, add uh, my two cents on that, I think that this is particularly important. Uh, the last point you mentioned is particularly important in the EU landscape, which is a lot more fragmented, generally speaking, in terms of implementing these policies and implementing the clean energy transition, because each country has different responsibilities at different levels. So in Italy, maybe the regions that are responsible for something, whereas in another country is more centralized and vice versa. So I think that this is a, a crucial part, the engaging the community, and it's particularly hard to do it when it's all so different from country to country because it, it's hard to design an approach. And uh, the last point that I wanted to make on this is I think that this is also true for, for the research community. A lot of us need to really understand what type of questions to research and what type of answers to provide, both for the policy process that really is relevant for the communities that are going to be impacted, so in this point. So uh, mindful of the time, let me ask, let me just do the following and ask uh, um, a second set of questions to the other three speakers, namely Marion, Hannah and Jan. And uh, um, I think my point, uh, uh, my, my, what I would like to focus on, if you don't mind, is I think uh, these questions, which I think would help us go forward, uh, in the discussion, even after this policy session as a group, broadly speaking, which is what methodological challenges uh, do you think, uh, I mean, did you experience when identifying policies or instruments were carrying out your research um, um, regarding ways to overcome the negative effects of this transition? And um, also, as a follow-up question, what gaps do you see, what big gaps do you see in research um, I guess this should be an easy question to answer because most of us are already trying to fill such gaps, right? So it shouldn't be that hard. But if we were to push ourselves, what would we really want to achieve uh, over the long term uh, as a community that focuses on just transition issues uh, um, in research? So let me just uh, pick on you so I give a, 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 a flow to the conversation. May I start from Hannah and then go to Marion and then Jan, if you don't mind, closing. Is that okay? Sure. Um, so I think one thing that becomes really apparent when we talk about this is that most of us have looked at policies and instruments that have been implemented already in the past. But when we think about the challenges ahead, I mean, we've seen the graph in your presentation, Elena, in the beginning, the speed of climate change reduction, the changes we will have or would have if we actually were meant to achieve 1.5 degrees or even 2 degrees. I mean, it's much quicker, the scale is much bigger. So from a methodological perspective, does it even make sense to only look at the past and take these instruments and then project them in the future? Or do we need something completely new to actually achieve this more transformational impact that, yeah, I think we're just simply facing? Um, and then two more things I really wanted to highlight. One thing is, I think it became most illustrative in Jan's presentation when we talked about this miner. So we have this image of the people we we're taking care of, and it's mostly white men. And I think even though these are jobs we should really take care of, and it's great that they have the unions and the representation, that's also so many other people affected of this, 
two examples women just not having these jobs often yeah simply being in in different sectors or even being at home at the moment because this is why because you have this one really high salary and then the other person staying at home and then the other thing being affected research from the uk and the us on covid now air pollution close to power plants those people have been so affected but we don't include them in our transitional policies we're trying to design which i think is something uh, we should think about and then the last point i want to make is because we have this conversation right now in the german case so much the compensations that companies in these industries still receive and i think they're not additional but they're partly in competition with money that goes to workers and communities or other affected people and i think it's yeah we have to start tackling this yes indeed so marian can i ask you to comment on those as well but you're muted right now. Yeah, yes, sure. Um, yeah, so for challenges, I, I already mentioned some of them. Um, and I think, you know, on the, on the um, aspect of the taxonomy being rather um, complicated to come up with, I think, you know, this is something we can, we can handle. And we've seen examples of, of this happening, um, you know, in the context of uh, studying the commons and institutions and policies to manage the commons, you know, in the Eleanor Ostrom sort of um, uh, tradition, I think in the same, and, and it has led to quantitative insights and capacity to do comparative work and, uh, you know, really move the field forward. I think we can arrive at a similar sort of level of subtlety and context sensitivity while uh, accumulating knowledge. I think that's what we have to aim for. I think it's possible, it's difficult, but with combining our efforts, we can do it. Um, I'm interested in, in the gaps. Um, so uh, first, from a theory point of view, you know, what's comparable here? Um, is a coal transition sufficiently comparable to um, shutting down, down um, oil rigs? And is it sufficiently comparable to, you know, deindustrialization um, that we've experienced in Europe and the US and possibly to, you know, um, uh, stopping, um, uh, uh, bringing down the amount of uh, palm oil production in Indonesia. I don't know, like a, a taxonomy of transitions themselves um, and what are the factors that make them similar or different. Um, I think and, and, uh, the issue of mobility, like when can we expect people to actually move? And, because oftentimes we see people don't move. Um, and so that's, uh, um, uh, but, but we also have ghost towns in the U.S., you know, people who were forced to move and they did move. And so I'm, um, uh, given the, the, the challenge of such transitions in a rural context where there's almost nothing else going on, the question of, you know, of, of, of movement in those contexts, I think, is, is really important um, and uh, under uh, considered uh, in, in very, you know, um, politically, of course, um, uh, dramatic. So in, in the same way, like on the political economy front, you know, what are, what are the incentives of, uh, and, and, you know, ideological frameworks that lead different policymakers and constituencies and advocacy groups to actually care about regions uh, and to promote these kinds of policies. Um, so the, the sort of level of solidarity that uh, voters, you know, who are might be in different regions have to feel for those to then make that a national conversation. And it seems like, according to um, the presentation from Jake, that's starting to happen and um, presentation from Felix. But um, that's a, a, in, in many countries, uh, we haven't had that sort of region sensitivity, regional sensitivity in the past. Um, and uh, is that changing? Is that mostly a question of ideas? Is that mostly a question of basic electoral incentives? You know, I think is an important uh, agenda for the political economists out there. Yeah. Good, a lot of things on the table. So hopefully we will meet again discussing them. You know, <laughs> it's a good, uh, good start to go on. Uh, Jan, I'm gonna ask you your insights. Uh, we have the last three minutes. I apologize guys for pushing you, but we've been given a tight uh, uh, deadline. So here you go, Jan. <laughs> okay, so very briefly, I wanted to also address the Anna's point. So I absolutely agree. So in the household of minors, usually wives are staying at home, not working, and perhaps active, making them active 
uh, helping them to find jobs this could be part of the solution because it will be easier for the other parts to, to change job then. However, when we do it, we, we have to be absolutely certain we do it with respect to their culture and, and their preferences because if we don't respect that, it can be actually counter counterproductive. Uh, regarding, the, regarding the methods and, and, and potential gaps there, so I, I, we have a lot of descriptive studies which is, which is very, very important and it's absolutely important first step, but I little bit miss econometric evidence which policies work. For example, if investment in infrastructure in those regions have those, those regions, uh, in, in Europe who went through transition to, to, to recover quicker, to, 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 to lower unemployment. So there's a lot of questions we can address. If, you know, we need proper uh, econometric evidence for that and, and we don't have it. Uh, and the last, uh, I don't know, it's maybe not a research question, but the role for us, for our community, is to communicate, um, communicate to, to miners, to stakeholders, what is the future or the, what are the, 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 the potential possible pathways. Um, the government in Poland, but I guess also in many other countries, countries completely failed regarding this. They are like good grandfathers who go and tell to miners, no worries, everything will be fine, the future will be beautiful. Then they go to Greenpeace and tell, no worries, we'll take care of climate change, don't worry about this. They say to everyone what they want to hear, but as a result, we are in big problems uh, because um, people, stakeholders need guidance. They have to get consistent signals, where are we heading? Otherwise, they're going to invest their effort and the resources into activities that don't have future. So you can imagine the young workers who are now, now going to mining schools because they expect they are going to work 30 years in mining and they don't know yet this is not going to be the case. So we, that's the role, the governments don't fail to do it, that's our role to communicate to stakeholders what are, you know, what are, what are the futures. Thank you. Guys, thank you so much. I have Helena, to... Can I say one last thing on that topic? It'll be very, very brief. Okay, super brief because we're going to be shut off. Yes. So I just want to extend the participatory process comment to research as well. And it's something that we're starting to grapple with in the United States in the context of our power research that stakeholders should be involved not only in the policy making but also in the research and that's hard. Yes. Wes, thank you because that would have been the last thing I wanted people in this session to hear. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Just a big thank you to all of you guys, to all the attendees who were um, patient enough to stay with us and, and listen to our research agenda. Thank you to IRI, thank you to TU Berlin for organizing this, and I'm just going to let it go because they need the time to transition. I really hope to see you guys very soon and to talk about these issues again. Thank you, a big thank you from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.